Today on The Grave Talks, Brave Investigator, a conversation with Christy Williams. As a little girl, Christy Williams discovered she had a fascination with the paranormal. An intrigue sparked by Robert Stack and Unsolved Mysteries in the 1980s and early 90s. Could the world be that mysterious? Could ghosts really exist? Christy Williams bravely went into that world on a mission to get answers. From paranormal investigations to taking on owning a notoriously haunted house and oddities museum, Christy knows the bright and the dark side of the supernatural. This is her story on The Grave Talks. Uh, well, it's kind of weird because I remember, you remember the show Unsolved Mysteries? Um, <laughs> oh, yes. The only ones I ever wanted to watch were the ones about ghosts. Yep. <laughs> like, Me too. You know, I didn't care about any of the other stories. <laughs> it was the ghost stories that I wanted to hear. Yeah. Um, so I guess at a very young age, I just had a fascination with it. Um, and then, of course, I grew up... Um, half of my childhood was I grew up in Chicago and I lived near Resurrection Cemetery, which mm. is one of the most famous ghost stories. Um, and then um, when, by the time I was 14 years old, the place to go hide and party was um, the, what was it? Um, oh gosh, now I can't remember what it's called. There's a, it's a cemetery and it's in Midlothian, Illinois. It's home of one of the most famous ghost pictures ever taken. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, what for whatever uh, bachelor's grove cemetery that's okay. it um and so it's kind of crazy because um remembering going there as a kid and hiding in this forest preserve and drinking in the cemetery <laughs> and seeing things happen and then years later down the road um ghost adventures was there and caught some of the same things that we actually saw when we were there um just goofing around as kids so i mean i just kind of always had this fascination and I can think back on times where you know paranormal stuff happened but I was just like "Eh, it's this it's that Um, and it wasn't until I don't know six years ago or so that I decided I just couldn't deny it anymore Sure. (laughs) so I don't yeah it's kind of weird I've always been fascinated by it um, but uh, the squirrel cage jail um, I was doing an investigation there and I guess I was just kind of annoyed. Um, it was one of my very first like actual investigations. And so I was just kind of like, whatever, there's nothing here. Nothing's going to happen. Like scare me, do something like make me believe in it. Um, and it felt like a giant man behind me just kind of put his body up against me and started walking forward. And so my body started going forward and I'm thinking there's someone behind me and nobody was there. Um, <laughs> what, so I was like, okay, well, I guess I have to admit things now. What so. was that like? I mean, prior to, to having that experience where you're, you know, having the moment of, okay, I got to admit things. I mean, were you on the fence? When you look at it, honestly, were you on the fence with it? Was it kind of a defense mechanism of like, I'm going to keep telling myself that maybe this isn't real? What? Where were you prior to that experience? Um, I think that I always... I I think a lot of investigators will kind of agree to this, Um, but I was always kind of skeptic in that um, it's like when something happens, you don't really admit to it because it's just not enough. Mm -hmm. It's never enough evidence. It's never strong enough evidence. It's never, it's just never good enough. Um, No matter how much evidence you get, you receive, it becomes kind of like an addiction Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) and you just want more and more and more and more. So I think even to, as a kid, you're just like, oh, well, I'm just a kid or, you know, I would, you know, I'm just making it up in my head. You don't really want to um, see it, I guess, for what it is. So I've always been skeptical. I've always believed in ghosts, but always been skeptical of the evidence, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Sure. No, that that does make sense. And there there is a lot of of stories that were based uh, in that neck of the woods. I grew up north of you about three hours uh, in northeast Wisconsin. So uh, I remember many of the the Resurrection Mary stories and such and Unsolved Mysteries. And I did the same thing. I only cared about the ghost episodes. The best one was the Halloween one where he was on the Queen Mary. <laughs> and yes, that was a great episode. Yeah. Um, uh, another uh, another story yeah. that uh, that re- resounded with me was something that was north of you about two hours or so and about an hour south of me, the bunk bed. Um, Do you remember the bunk bed story on Unsolved Mysteries, the haunted bunk bed? No, I've never... 
never. No, I oh. don't remember this at all. Oh, that was a good one. That uh, and it's funny because on the our other program, Real Ghost Stories Online, uh, I had a, a weird uh, connection that came up with it all those years later, and I'll get to that in a moment. But what happened in that story is this: this family had a bunk bed, and this happened in Horicon, Wisconsin, and they they had all this paranormal activity that began in the house of the father seeing things almost as if the house was on fire one night, the kids getting freaked out, all these horrible, weird things. They get rid of the bunk bed. It all stops. And then, you know, 25 years later, I begin doing a ghost podcast. Uh, this is about eight years ago now. Um, I and I start noticing a weird trend is all these people have stories that somehow involve a bunk bed and i don't know what the correlation is why there's this correlation but it's one of the most common items i ever get in ghost stories is a bunk bed so much so that i made it into a joke and i have a bunk bed bell in my studio and every time the word bunk bed comes up we ring the bell we ended up giving it out as like premium items to our subscribers uh with our logo on it and so people can ding away at home while they listen along with every time the word bunk bed comes up but it, it's it's one of those things where dude that's crazy i know just these weird correlations that come up and i've been trying to figure out was there like some bunk bed factory where somebody was doing like satanic rituals on the bunk bed you know and then i don't know i mean it's just <laughs> utterly oh bizarre I, don't, I do not know what the correlation is and i hope to figure it out someday what for you were some of the the stories on well, all i know i want go, I, go ahead i was gonna say i want a haunted bunk bed now <laughs> Well, there's plenty of dumps, oh, I'm sure, own. that have them. You know, it's like, oh, I think this is a remnant of a bunk bed. It's kind of build your own haunted bunk bed and see what you get. Back to the conversation in just a moment. First, I want to thank our supporter today. If you love the Grave Talks and you're looking for another podcast to binge, let us tell you about Strange and Unexplained with Daisy Egan. Do you believe in ghosts? How about Bigfoot? Do you think it's strange and fascinating that a four-year-old in Oklahoma could look at a black and white picture of a man from the 1930s and say... That was me before. And then provide actual, verifiable details of the man's life? If so, Strange and Unexplained with Daisy Egan is about to be your new favorite podcast. Daisy is a Tony Award-winning actor, writer, and true crime fanatic, but she's also a skeptic. Each week, she looks at real stories, hauntings, disappearances, UFO encounters, the Bermuda Triangle, near-death experiences, and anything else that feels just beyond what we can easily make sense of. She is your guide into the inexplicable details of these stories. But she's also like, show me the receipts. So if you want to dive into the unexplained, check out Strange and Unexplained with Daisy Egan. Find Strange and Unexplained with Daisy Egan wherever you get podcasts. What for you were some of the stories awesome. that uh, that really spoke to you, uh, you know, as a child watching programs like Unsolved Mysteries? What were the ones that really kind of drew you in? Well, definitely Resurrection Mary. And I think, Res I mean, Resurrection Mary is always probably going to be the top one. And there's a lot of reasons for that one. I used to drive by it every day. Mm -hmm. um, I also have family members buried in that cemetery. Wow. You know, that Resurrection Mary has been a huge part of my whole life, you know, just because I lived there. And um, I remember my dad pointing out, oh, look, they're trying to paint over the gate again. Um, and a week later, it's the black marks are back, you know? And so, I mean, I grew up watching that whole story, you know, it's really more, I think those stories, you know, specifically, that's the one that I remember really the most. I think I was just so fascinated with it all of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and I'm trying, there was another one and I can't, I can't, it's been so long since I watched it. Um, but I can't, I can't even remember the story, but there was another one that I used to watch all the time. And I think it was about a girl who like drowned in a lake or something. And I kind of remember it, but not, not quite. So sure. <laughs> I won't even go there. It's been a um, while. Yeah. But I think Resurrection Mary was definitely the top one. It yeah. has. Well, they, and now they're starting to release it. And I started going back and watching some of it, but it's hard to find just the ghost ones because I, I don't care about anything else. I know. There's a lot of, there's a lot of fast forwarding <laughs> that I'm doing. I'm trying to introduce so. my eight-year-old into it and she absolutely loves it. But we're doing the same thing. It's like, yeah, where's the ghost ones? And That's you, awesome. Yeah, we fast forward, but it, it's it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> 
So um, tell me about you. You yeah. said that as as a teen, you know, you're going into the cemetery doing what, you know, teenagers do uh, and, you know, you're having fun. But you said things had happened in there as well that you really can't explain. What were some of those things that happened back then? Um, well, the one thing um, that I always tell people about, just because it was kind of cool to years later see it um, on Ghost Adventures, is the, the bright white lights that you would see that would appear out of nowhere. And, you know, the thing is, is the, I guess you have to really go there to understand that it's not going to be a car. It's not going to be, I mean, you're really in the middle of a, a forest preserve. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those places that you don't know where it is unless you know where it is. Mm -hmm. um, you have to kind of be someone who lives there and knows the place and whatever, and you know how to get there. And so these white lights that would just float around and you have, you know, no clue where they're coming from. Um, and then also there was like every now and then it would look like a house in the distance and you would try to walk towards it. And no matter how close you got, you never got close to it. And so that was kind of a weird thing that we always saw. And I don't think that was ever caught on camera. Nobody really understands that one either. Um, I actually went back. <laughs> you do get trespassing tickets now, but it was well worth it. Um, I went <laughs> back uh, a few years ago as an adult and I was there at um, like three o'clock in the morning. And by then I was living in South Carolina. So I had South Carolina plates on my car, um, which helped talk me out of a bigger ticket. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I I was there at like three in the morning and it was just me and um, two of my friends, her, her kids, they were teenagers. So they weren't like little, little. Um, and we're there at like three in the morning and I'm taking pictures and I actually captured a photo um, by a tree and it looks like a female in a red dress who's like it almost she's she's cradling her arms almost like she's holding a baby um, but I always show people this picture and I don't tell them what they what they're looking at I'm like what do you see and they actually usually mistake this spirit for oh is that your friend and I'm like no <laughs> wow yeah um so i mean it's a pretty it was in the dark it was taken with an older camera um and so to be able to look at it and see kind of how it looks is still pretty amazing when you think about it um and then if you take a closer look people will start seeing other figures and faces in the photo and it's pretty it's pretty amazing it was an amazing photo that, so yeah i mean that's amazing when when someone is oh is that your friend uh it's not like what is that over there when when it's that clear uh, mm -hmm. and, and i'm not great at looking at, at ghost photos and, and saying oh there's a ghost there because th i mean there's obviously so many you know abnormalities and you can look at things but obviously the best ones are like that where it's like oh there's a person there wait no there wasn't a person there uh that that's, yeah. <laughs> that's what can really stand out i had one a couple years back that was sent in to me and I think it was taken in the London underground and I, they said look at these ghost photos and I said where's the ghost they're like the person in the photo is the ghost I'm like that just looks like a guy hanging out in the subway and it like that guy was not there yeah so, I mean I'm having to take them at their word but it was it was kind of just bizarre and and creepy with that that sort of feeling cemeteries are interesting places uh and and I'd love to get your take on this uh and I ask this semi often and it's just an opinion based question cemeteries other than people like us uh, who like to go spend time in them uh, most people don't it, it, it's not a place that you know anyone really frequents all that often unless you're going to to visit a loved one or for a funeral really um, why do you think it is that cemeteries seem to hold so many spirits because quite often we hear them of you know in their place of residence or at places that they actually did frequent cemeteries usually not one of those areas uh is there something where we're still hanging out with our bodies is there something where we can just kind of go wherever we may be seen what, what what's your opinion on that um i mean i have lots of different thoughts i guess on cemeteries and i am one of those people who hung out in cemeteries. i used to take my kids on picnics in cemeteries because they're quiet <laughs> yep they're usually quiet and they're beautiful um but um i mean i think that a lot of times you know in my opinion, I think people, when they pass on, they try to attach themselves to something familiar. And what's more familiar to your spirit than your own body? Mm -hmm. You know, I can't imagine anything else being more familiar. Um, and I also, you know, when I think about um, 
Boucher's Grove in particular, um, I think there's a lot of spirits there because there's a pond there where they say Al Capone dumped um, bodies. So whether he was killing people there or whatever, you know, so some of those people might be stuck there. Um, there's other um, cemeteries. I'm actually in South Carolina right now and by one of my favorite locations, which is the Bull Street Asylum. Um, and they had their own cemetery where they would put certain people. So there were like mass graves, but a lot of the mass graves that are there are from people who went missing and people who had mental problems and um, just, you know, really sad random cases of disappearing people and mysterious deaths and whatever. And, you know, if you think about, you know, somebody who was in a facility like this asylum, um, if family members don't even claim their body, what's familiar to them? Maybe they just don't know. And so I think a lot of times, you know, if you're just stuck, you're going to stay where you're, where it's easiest for you. And that's going to be with your body, maybe waiting for your family to come back or somebody, anybody to come care about you. You know, it's really kind of sad. <laughs> I, I guess when I think about it, you know, um, I don't know. I just feel like there, and I think another thing that we might consider too is, you know, what are a lot of the gravestones made out of? You know, we talk about limestone, which has a natural ability to hold and record energy. Um, so maybe that has something to do with it, but who knows? You know, that's just my opinion. Sure. And so much of it is conjecture and opinion. And that's what I like to hear from everyone is, you know, nobody has the, you know, set in stone facts. It's a collection of opinions. And eventually you kind of start to see trends in things with with the, the spirits that, that reside in cemeteries, especially when you have something like that, where there's a mass grave or a situation like Al Capone dumping bodies into a lake. Uh, and, and it's a very sudden, very, you know, undignified death. When you, as an investigator, are there and, and you're trying to get evidence, trying to communicate in some way, shape, or form, do you get any sort of communication that leads you to kind of feel that maybe these spirits are, are confused? I mean, stuck is one thing, but I, I think confusion can lead to being stuck if you're kind of in that weird state. The only way I can describe it would be when you sometimes have a dream and the dream is, is kind of out there, but your reality is very different. You may not be who you are or things around you in life. You don't re remember or even recognize you're just kind of in this weird place. Um, I, I wonder if that's what it may be like for some of these spirits where they're not seeing the full picture. It's very much with blinders on and just right here and now is where they're at, but it seems to be, you know, almost groundhog day. Like it keeps going on over and over and over, but they're conscious do you get evidence that points to them being confused in those sort of situations? Um, I mean, I think it's, I think it can be like just because they were human at one time. So I believe they still, you know, when you die, you still maintain that because your spirit is ultimately what does make you human, you know? And so I think, you know, there's going to be some people who are confused. I mean, just think of a sudden tragic death, mm -hmm. like, and then all of a sudden you're somewhere else. And how is that not confusing? Um, so I think sometimes I do get, you know, responses where they're trying to figure out who they are or why they're there or what's going on, or maybe they don't know that they're, you know, even dead, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but I also, cause I do a lot of investigating. And one of the things that I started doing was, I'll lock myself into a place alone. I'm the only one in there. I'll do a live feed and I'll just do an investigation completely by myself. Um, and the number one question I always ask always is, are you here because you're stuck? Or are you here by choice? You know, basically, can you come and go as you please? And I always get the same answer that they can come and go as they please. Um, and I think they just kind of frequent places that they're familiar with, um, and, you know, thinking about somebody who died suddenly or whatever, they may be, you know, maybe stuck or maybe just confused at why are they still there? Because if we think about people in the spirit realm, as opposed to us, time no longer exists. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we think they're coming and going, but in reality, maybe they're never leaving or maybe they're only there for a second, but to us, it feels like hours or maybe they think it's hours. The, the, concept of time 
between the two no longer exists simultaneously. And so I think that makes a lot of things really confusing. Confusing for them and, and also confusing for us because we're almost trying to define it through our mm-hmm. prism of time. And I mean, and just to wrap your mind around the concept of time not existing, I mean, that's a difficult one in itself. Mm-hmm. It, it is. It, it very much is. Like, you know, it's like... <laughs> I always explain it as the story of there was a war that happened hundreds of years ago, but by the time the opposing team showed up, the the original team had already died because they were there waiting for three months because they didn't have time together. Mm-hmm. Um, so in their heads, they showed up at the same time, but they really weren't there at the same time. Yeah. Um, and that's a true story. So. <laughs> wow. What, so what, tell me, what made you decide to kind of take your, your interest, um, as an adult, I'm assuming, you know, a little few years later uh, after hanging out in the cemeteries, drinking, uh, and, and having those experiences to, to more of a, <laughs> a, a more of a serious, you know, level of, um, you know, I, I, I want to investigate these things. I want to, you know, kind of go and, and be more part of it other than it just being kind of this passion I enjoy watching on television. Well, I kind of, well, I mean, I've always... I guess I, <laughs> sorry, I'm stumbling over my words, but I actually um, have always been a filmmaker. So I went to school for film mm-hmm. um, and sound design and all that. And so that's what my degree is in. And I just, a friend of mine that I worked with, he was actually my boss. And he was like, hey, we're going to the Velisca Axe Murder House and spending the night. I thought you'd be interested. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> um, so we went um, and nothing really happened that night, um, but we had a lot of fun. And so we decided to go do it again. And then the second time we went was actually at the squirrel cage jail. And Jeremy said, he said, Hey, you know, like, can you just make a little video of the evidence we caught and me having this filmmaker degree, just put together what we, we call our first episode, but it was an accident. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I kind of put it together and people started watching and then people wanted more. So we started doing it more and then it just kind of grew and grew and grew. Um, So I'm not really sure that I intended it to become what it's become, um, but I'm definitely not disappointed. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah. So it's it, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And of course, now we own a haunted location, so tell it me, just keeps on going. So tell me about that. Tell me about the haunted location that you own. How did that come about? What is it? Let, let's let's start from the beginning there. Okay, so I one of the things that I enjoy doing just to get away and relax is urbex thing, you know, urban exploration, abandoned house hunting, whatever you want to call it. Um, And so I had been doing this and my business partner basically was mad because he's like, you're going to get hurt. You're going to die. So me being me just puts out a blast on Facebook. Hey, like... (laughs) anyone want to go do this? Um, and this guy that I know, Keith responded and he's like, I'll do it with you. And he sends me all these pictures of abandoned buildings. And I just decided to go without him anyway. And I drive out to Wymore, Nebraska and I message him and I'm like, Hey, where are all these buildings? And he's like, you're here. I live here. <laughs> um, and I was like, awesome. So I went and picked him up and we started going around and I started learning about the history of this town. And like from the moment that I stepped foot in that place, in this town, I was just, I don't know. It's just one of those things where you know that it's something amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, And the history of this place is just crazy. Um, And so at the time I was actually um, filming for um, World's Most Terrifying Places. And so we were talking to the producers from that show um, and Travel Channel and they said, well, if you make a documentary and we like it, we'll buy it, you can film it. So that's kind of the direction we started going, which that hasn't happened yet two years later. Um, But that was the direction we started going. And I said, well, I'm probably gonna need like an office or something here. Um, So a guy in town who owned, it's called the Stevenson building. Um, So he owned this place, he was using it for storage and he offered it to me. And I said, I said, well, I don't want it if it's not haunted. Um, so (laughs) not usually something that comes up in in real estate negotiations. Yeah, pretty much. And so, so he's like, well, you can have access to the building for two months. Um, and so I started spending the night there pretty much every weekend. Um, and it became very clear to me that there was a lot of weird activity. Like there'd be a female just start singing. You would hear walking around upstairs, doors opening and closing, things moving, lights turning on and off. Like it was nonstop. And so I invited Um, another friend of mine, I said, you need to come and just 
verify that I'm not insane. Mm -hmm. Um, So he started coming with me and he would investigate with me. And we just started getting more and more just evidence of stuff. And I was like, okay, we're taking it. Like, that's it. I had to talk my other partner into into it because he's so like, oh my God, what if it fails? What if it's bad? What if nobody likes? I'm like, just shut up and take a risk. Um, And so we did, the three of us went in and we bought the building together. um, And it has now become an oddities museum as well as a haunted location um, because we're just weirdos. Um, So we have all kinds of crazy stuff in there. Um, And uh, one of our items is Peace Bottom. Um, and he's the little clown puppet that was made by uh, women in the concentration camps in Germany. Oh, wow. Uh, there's there's actually, if you go look up the Stevenson building, um, there's EVPs where there's a little, it's a little boy's voice, clear as day. And he's like, I'm stuck in this box. Um, it's wow. so cute. He's evil, but it's cute. <laughs> anyway, um, so <laughs> it's just grown into this. <laughs> I know he's literally in a box with chains. That's how we got him. Um, and now he's in that, plus he's behind glass. Um, but he never disappoints. I mean, he's just a crazy little, crazy little dude. Um, but it's just grown into this. But the the building itself, um, it has some of the most insane history. There's tunnels that run underneath. Um, Al Capone was there. He used it to run liquor. Uh, the town itself used to be, they used to call it the Sin City to the West mm-hmm. um, because it was a huge train town. Um, there were orphan trained kids that went there. Um, there are seven confirmed deaths within the building itself. Uh, I mean, it's really just, it's just an insane story. Uh, it has ties to the Odd Fellows. It has ties to the KKK. It has ties to um, a serial killer that was in Rulu, Nebraska. Um, I mean, you just name it. It just gets darker and darker as we go. The town historian hates us. Um, she wants us to keep everything happy and cheery. And we're like, well, this is the truth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, yeah. it sounds like, I mean, it, it sounds like it'd been used for various purposes over its lifetime. Yes, it has. Um, so it initially um, started, uh, Sam Wymore founded the town. He bought the land. He put the building on there and then wanted to move to Arizona. Um, and so he gave, um, he gave, uh, he didn't give them the building, but they like the Murdoch family, he put them in charge. And so they were supposed to take care of his finances and stuff, but instead they ended up stealing $15,000 from him. Mm. Um, and so Sam Wymore started a lawsuit and eventually he just couldn't deal with it anymore because he, it was just making him sick. He wasn't doing well. So he handed it over to George Stevenson. Um, and then when Sam Weimar passed away a couple months later, he actually ended up winning the lawsuit against the Murdochs. Um, so George Stevenson takes over the building, but he's like the financial guy. So if you wanted a loan, if you wanted real estate, um, if it had to do with money, you had to go through George Stevenson. Mm-hmm. And so he ended up marrying Nellie Beer, who came from Chicago. And in 1901, she ran the railroad. And so that set off a signal to me. I'm like, why is a female in 1901 in that time period running a railroad? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they don't even like work, have jobs, let alone run a railroad. Yeah. Um, and it turns out that this railroad was the only mob owned railroad that went all the way from New York City to Las Vegas. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, so then I, yeah, so then I started looking for ties to from Nelly to the mob and they weren't coming. They weren't coming. Um, and then in the basement, we found two illegal poker chips, po- poker chips from the Southland Mafia. So then when we went, digging on information for Southland Mafia, we were finally able to link the building and Nellie to the mob in Chicago. Um, (laughs) And it just, (laughs) then it just kept going. And it's just been this crazy thing. And the the tunnel entrances, there's four, we're the only building with four entrances and the tunnels were initially used to run steam heat to the main hotel. Mm -hmm. And then when they didn't need it anymore, um, they started using the tunnels to run liquor um, they started using them for prostitution, things like that. Um, the crime got so bad in those tunnels that they built another set of tunnels that was manned by a private police force. <laughs> oh, wow. To maintain the crime in the tunnels. And the central point of all of this was the basement of our building. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was <laughs> yeah. And it just keeps it just keeps getting crazier. And then, of course, we bring in all the oddities and it just makes it worse. Um, <laughs> but that's us. <laughs> 
<laughs> when you have a building like that, that that had seen so much, you know, negative, nefarious activity uh, over I its lifetime, uh, one would assume that that some of the characters and things you're going to run across, even if they are, you know, human spirits, they're not going to be the most positive of human spirits. They're not going to be the I'm going to help you out and help you find your keys ghosts. Um, I'm sure that maybe some of that yeah. exists as well, but uh, but there's probably some of the the negativity there as well. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's definitely accurate. Um, I you know, there's some people who may listen to this who have been to uh, McIntyre Villa, which is a haunted location in Atchison. Um, Kansas, but I happen to be very good friends with the owner. She's one of my best friends. Um, and this girl, like, if you know her, you understand she just doesn't make stuff up. It's just not like her. She didn't even notice it. Um, but the same night that we got the really good EVPs from Peace Bottom, uh, the clown puppet, she ended up with insane scratches all over her leg. And you know, a lot of times people say, Oh, I got scratched. And you'll take a picture and you're like, Oh, it looks a little red. And you know, the photos of the scratches are pretty hardcore and it, she didn't even notice it um, until she was changing. And then the other girl that was with us was like, Oh my God, what happened to your leg? <laughs> yeah. Um, so of course we took pictures and documented it because she didn't have them there before she would have known um, because they are so incredibly, I, I mean, it's just, I, you have to see the picture to really understand, but it's just like, wow, holy cow. Um, and so we've had people talk about getting scratched and we have had people talk about getting pushed and getting their hair pulled. And um, some people can't handle it. Um, Brian and Rochelle from Ghost Hunters, um, they came out and Rochelle couldn't even stay in the front room. She just got instantly sick um, and had to leave. So she would just kind of bypass the front room whenever she could. Um, we do have like things that get thrown. Um, I actually was there one night sleeping and um, something threw a, a mannequin out of the front window. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which, of course, I documented it because I like I wake up and I, I had a mannequin dressed and uh, he had a yellow hazmat suit on and he, that was in our display window. Um, and so I'm I hear this loud crash and I'm kind of, you know, half awake and I open my eyes and all I see is yellow. And I'm like, is that the mannequin? Um, so I literally just start filming and you can tell I just woke up and I'm like, well, here's the mannequin on the floor. And he had heavy bricks on his base um, and the bricks were busted up all over the place. So, <laughs> wow. you know, things like that have happened. <laughs> um, we're used to it. So we don't really... Um, you know, people will be like, oh, there's furniture moving upstairs and people walking around. And we're like, yeah, it happens all the time. Um, we're just so used to it consistently happening that we just you kind of tune it out. <laughs> it's probably sad to say, but it's when you spend enough time there, that's what happens. <laughs> well, when, when you're in any situation, uh, paranormal or not, and just you're you're absorbing it and it just becomes normal and, and you're accepting it. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's understandable how how you would feel that way. That wraps up the first part of our conversation with Christy Williams, brave investigator. In part two of our conversation, does she ever fear for her safety with the power that these entities seem to hold in her museum? Did Christy see an increase in activity when putting haunted objects into a haunted building? How does Christy protect herself and the guests from the risks associated with being in a continually active haunted location? What's the history of the haunted clown puppet Peace Bottom? And what made Christy decide to investigate by herself? Does she feel she gets better results with that method? All of that and more in part two of our conversation. Until next time for The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.